morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to today's Gibbs Flash Forum. We're really in for a treat today as I welcome you this morning. My name is Dr. Frank Makwegwe. I'm a faculty member at Gibbs. Uh, I teach in the finance area as well as in resilience, managing stress, and broadly employee well being. I do a lot of research on resilience. And resilience is often defined as a process of adapting positively to trauma, to tragedy, and to obstacles that people face generally in life. When I got the opportunity to read the book that is the center of our discussion today, I just said, wow, this is resilience. This is what resilience means. So we'll have an hour to spend with Dr. Taban this morning, and we'll get to explore his journey. We'll get to get a first-hand feel of what does resilience mean? What does making choices mean? What does a mindset of never giving up mean? Before we get started, just some housekeeping. We would love to have a dialogue, a conversation. So please use the chat function and the Q&A function. As we start our journey, if we have read the book, if we have looked up our guest online, you've got questions for him, please let's get those going in the chat. I'll constantly go and check your questions as I continue my dialogue with Dr. Taban and make sure that we address your questions. So what are we talking about today? It's my privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Emmanuel Taban to this Gibbs Flash Forum. We're talking about this book. And you can see, as an academic, I've just been so fascinated by many concepts in the book that I've made so many notes. So the first thing that is part of my housekeeping this morning is to say, if you haven't got a copy of this amazing book, please do yourself a favor. Get a copy, especially in the post-pandemic world where we have seen high levels of stress, high levels of anxiety, search for purpose in life, search for meaning. Those are themes that are in this book. It's available at all good bookstores, exclusive books being one of them. It's published by Jonathan Ball Publishers. Let me go into what we're gonna talk about today. Welcome, Dr. Taban. Thank you so much, not only for joining us on this forum, but for putting time aside to write this amazing book. So here is where I would like to start. My first question to you is, please tell me a little bit more about the title. The title of the book, in case you didn't see it when I showed you a copy of mine, The Boy Who Never Gave Up, with a subtitle, A Refugee's Epic Journey to Triumph. Over to you, Dr. Emmanuel Taban. Thank you for being with us. Tell me about the title of the book. Uh, good morning, Frank. Thank you so much. And also, I would like to acknowledge the Gibbs Institution for the opportunity and to have a conversation with me. Here's the title, The Boy Who Never Gave Up, The Refugee Epic Journey to Triumph. I think the, the book first may be I need to allude to what's actually the, the wow, what's the book's all about? The book is really about a purpose. It's a journey of a boy who was homeless from destitute with absolute nothing, a joint looking in pursuit of education. And that was really the, 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 the purpose of the book. During the journey to education, of course, there's so many obstacles that are faced through the, through the way. And most of those obstacles, which were all thrown onto me, I could have given up on, on each and every of them. Most people could have given up, but I didn't. I made lemonade out of it. And that's what's really what the book is all about. That's why it's, it's titled The Boy Who Never Gave Up. And this journey, I took it when I was about 16 to the age of 18. So you could imagine most 16 and 18 years nowadays, they actually cannot take any journey, but even let alone out of the house, their own house. So that's really more the book come from the, the boy who never give up. The refugee epigenic to success is really more to do with about my achievement in the medical field 
and also the fact that I come from humble beginning and today I'm the person who I am. I'm world renowned, a well leading pulmonology in South Africa from humble beginning. And that's really the epic journey to success. Yes, that's what's really the title of the book, what, what it comes together about those values. Lovely. And it really, really captures that. Just to give you a sense, the chat is already buzzing. Uh, we've got uh, in our audience, uh, people have read the book and they're saying this has to be a set work for our schools. Our youngsters could learn many lessons from this. Once you read this book, you will never be the same. This book is needed for young people to build and develop resilience. So already lovely, lovely comments coming through. So how I want to run our conversation today is to help our audience get a sense of your being born in South Sudan, growing up, and then certain events that propelled you forward in your journey to be where you are. And in reflecting on these events, I almost label them in my notes that these are choices. So I'll ask you at some point to touch on the concept of choices, but I want to go straight into the book. My other question before we dig into your background is just tell me a little bit about the acknowledgement as well. So I found it quite interesting that um, you say to my mother, right? Phoebe Stephen and my father, Bishop Joe Sandry, may they rest in peace. Often I remember, even on my doctoral dissertation, you know, it's, it's, it means something deep inside yourself when you acknowledge people at the back of a, at the beginning of a dissertation or, you know, the beginning of a book. Tell me about why these two people, Dr. Taban, in your acknowledgement. I think my, my mother, of course, is, she played a very great part in my life. As a child, I remember she, number one, she got divorced before I was born. And she was assaulted while she was pregnant with me. And of course, when, when, when I was born, and she couldn't really, she was not educated. She only finished up to standard two. And for whatever reason, she could pinpoint that I was probably one of the child that could benefit from education as compared to the rest of siblings. Yeah. And she took incentive, initiative to actually put me to one of the best school to get a better education as compared to my siblings. And that's for me, for a mother to pinpoint that despite her having lack of education, it's amazing. Right. And throughout my life, because mothers play a critical role in upbringing of their children, whether in Africa, whether in Europe, everywhere in the world, educated mother bring the best out of their kids as compared to uneducated mothers. So mothers are very important in our lives. I mean, if you look in the scenario like South Africa, where 60% of the children are fatherless, especially in the black for, for communities. So, and if those mothers are not at home, you end having dysfunctional society. And I always say that if a mother dies, the family dies. But if a man dies, the family is still intact. And that's what actually, what my mother actually provides for, for me as a child without having a father. And in terms of Bishop Sandry, of course, when I arrived in South Africa, I had no father, I have no mother, but he, he took that role and fulfilled those roles for me, that he was willing to mentor me, sponsor me, and spend time with me, teaching me certain things that are of value as a man. And one of the important lessons is about, of course, hard work and productivity. And I remember that he'd been an Italian, and most people will think that I mean, he's an Italian, you're an African, you have the cultural difference. But reality is that there's no really cultural difference between the two societies. Work is work. Everybody needs to work. Everybody needs to be productive. And that's what he introduced in my life. And, and, and I think through that, and of course, he tried out of his best to make sure that I get into university, that I finish university. Even after finishing university, whenever I faced challenges, he was always there to me. And one of the important lessons that he taught me, I remember that when I went to a private practice and I have difficult with my colleagues in terms of work. And I went to him and I was very angry. I want to leave. And he said, you know what? Come, let's go and watch a TV. And went to watch TV and he played for me horse riding. And the horses were running. And during the, the, the running of the horses, one of the horses win. And he told me, have you seen? Look at the, the, the number nine horse won the race. 
I said, yes, what do you see? So I said, no, he won the race. Then he said, no, look again. And he played for me the same event over and over again. And I couldn't understood it. Then he told me, look at those horses. When they run, they never look at each other to see which one run faster, which one goes slower. What they do, they run their race to finishing line. And he taught me that I should focus on running my own race. And that probably, those values change who I am today. You are mute. You are mute, Frank. There's a question for us there, uh, Dr. Tevin. Is the book yet available as an audio book? Uh, not yet. I think not because yet. they still try to sell the copyrights, so it's not yet as an audio. Okay, thank you for that. So let's go into the book. There is a role of, um, of, of, of your mother. I want to go to page eight, where you say, after many years of traveling, reading, and learning, I understand the sort of long-term poverty I was born into is not inevitable for anyone. And it has nothing to do with God's will. It wasn't him that made us poor. In fact, the Republic of South Sudan, as my country is now known, could be one of the richest countries in the world. We have God given abundance of oil, gold, and other minerals lying under the ground. And our soil is so fatal that it's almost impossible to stop things from growing in it. Yet it is home to some of the poorest people on earth, people who still live in mud huts like the one I was raised in, with no electricity or running water, and who seldom have enough nutritious food to prevent their stomachs from aching. Many people have eyes, but they cannot see the riches of the country. They have accepted their status as victims of their own mentality. Right. Tell us a little bit more about that. That captures your growing up in a mad heart, but it also gives us your sense of how you relate to these rich countries with poor citizens. I, I think, like, I think, the, yes, that the, the story, if you look, it relates to South Sudan, but the reality is that it's not different from what you see in Deep Sloot, it's not different from what you see from Orange Farms. It's exactly the same kind of it's an African problem where we always think somebody somehow did us wrong. And, and I try to disagree with that notion that actually in life, the reason why Africa is poor, why South Sudan is poor, have absolutely nothing to do with, with God. It's absolutely got nothing to do with the country where you find yourself in. Like, I mean, if, if, if I was born in Europe, probably my circumstances would be different. The reason that because we have a system that enables you to succeed. While in Africa, the system works against you. And that's got nothing to do with God. It's God we do with our leadership. Our leadership and also our mindset. Even the leadership per se. Remember, leadership reflects the mindset of their people that brought them in. It's really have nothing to do with that. We don't bring a leadership from Europe and put in Africa. We bought them, they grow up through our street and they become our leaders. And that's always been my problems. So my point in life was that we have to kind of take responsibility and accept our failures first, if we have to progress forward. And when you see people are poorer in township, it's not because somebody has stolen something away from them. It's, I think it's more to do with the structure that they found themselves in. Because if that child is offered a proper opportunity, that child can become something that they want to be. And that was my perfect example, because if I was in South Sudan, I would never be where I am today. I could have been going after cows, I could have four wives or whatever it is, I would not have even grown to the stature of the person that I have. But the, 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 the system in South Africa of diversity, of course, helped me. And imagine that particular time when I arrived in South Africa, if I am actually going ahead to a, a colleague who said I should go to Soweto. And should I have gone to Soweto, my outcome could have been different compared to the way when I was in street going to, 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 to Bishop House. So for me, right. the, 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 the environment is never a factor that affects our outcome, but it's about really our own personal res resilience and where you find yourself as your family is concerned. So for me, is that each and every person, if you're poor, you need to ask yourself a question, why am I not doing well? You know, and going back to the black population, let's be honest. I have thought deeply inside that as a black male, include me at age of 44, 
I just think as a black male, we are not productive enough. We are far inferior as compared to our, our, um, to our, our peers in Europe and Japan and all that. We, we fail to change the continent. We fail to change the continent at all to, to kind of enable the young one to prosper. No matter how knowledge we have, we never create the conducive environment for the young one to become better in the, in the future. We always, what we do, we succumb to the role of victimhood, where we think somebody somehow owe us something. But the answer is no, the world does not owe you anything, but you owe the world everything. And that's an important, that's, that's what the, the story really tells me about. And that's what I want the people in South Sudan to understand that South Sudan is not even colonized with the European. We have all the lands, but we're still poorer because we cannot utilize the, what God has given us. Right. And so it's interesting you talk about this idea of um, it almost speaks to mindset, right? That don't be, don't blame things on victimhood or, or don't be a victim. This brings me to an earlier part of your book as well, going up when as a young person, you were working briefly uh, for um, a merchant trader. And here on page 54, you talk about um, a loan that you had taken and you were riding a bicycle and you were selling bread, then you got robbed. And ultimately you say, my attempt at becoming an entrepreneur had turned into a disaster. I owed something like $70 with no way to repay it. This incident taught me a valuable lesson. You cannot take out a loan to pay a loan or go into debt to pay off debt. That so resonated with me, not only your trying to use your entrepreneurial skills as a young person, but a message that you are sharing in your book around debt. We know in South Africa, currently consumers have a huge problem of high indebtedness. So could you touch briefly on that incident, what it means for you, you know, growing up and your relationship with money? Yeah, I, I think I think that's very very important because I think it, you know what I mean. Uh, I I was trading bread and then of course I got robbed. So instead of actually going to the trader, listen, I got robbed. I don't have the money. I would tr learn. I, I will try to pay you back. So what I did was to actually ask somebody else take her money and pay for the first trader, which was a wrong thing to do. I mean, if you look in society, how many of us actually trade a car that is not paid off and buying a new car that's even more expensive and they can't afford it. You understand? And that drives you in poverty forever and ever. And that's has always been our problems, wanting things that you cannot afford. Yeah. So looking into, into that, for me, it was a lesson for me to learn, to say that, listen, in life, you have to be responsible for your own, for your own, own outcome. Means the bread you eat, you must buy for it. You must pay for it. And, and you're not gonna borrow from someone. Like imagine when I came to South Africa, I have no family. And if I have 100 rand and I always spend that money, who do I go and borrow money from? The answer is nobody. I, I will end dying on the street. It means I end become responsible for my own uh, happiness and also for my own, uh, own food and the financial outcome. And that's, that's a reality. So yes, that's really, t it's a lesson that I learned from childhood and I still yeah. try to encourage people that, you know what, is if you earn 10 rand, that's enough. That's what you earn. Live within your means. Don't live outside your means. And don't start crazy ideas. Yes, I wanted to become an entrepreneur at that time, but I couldn't afford to be one. So why should I borrow something so much and want to start something larger scale? Why could I actually could I start smaller? And I think that was the lesson I learned at that young age. And today, I think probably I still carry those values with, with me. Thank you for that great lesson. Those who have joined a little bit late, we are in conversation with Dr. Emmanuel Teben. Is the author of The Boy Who Never Gave Up. And this is an amazing story that we're walking through of his journey all the way from South Sudan through several African countries, ultimately ending up in South Africa. And as we speak to him today on this Gibbs Flash Forum, we are talking not only to a doctor, but to one of the leading pulmonologists in the world. So if you've just joined us, Please put your questions in the Q&A as we go. We want to dialogue and answer them or in the chat function. I want to move a little bit more into your upbringing, Dr. Teben. I'm now on page 64, and I'm intrigued by your, your converting to...
being a Muslim that you talk about, you were asked, would you like to become a Muslim? He asked, yes, I said, surprised by the question and eager to please him. I was as willing to convert to Islam as I had been to convert to Catholicism. I'm sure that God would understand my reasons. I would like to become a Muslim. And of course, not only should you tell us a little bit about that choice and how you made it, please tell us how that led to you going to Khartoum. I think I think because I was first I was uh, that when I was arrested I was in White House then I was uh, I was tortured life was difficult and I didn't think that there was any way that I would escape my situation my predicament and that's when I was offered that opportunity it was not by force but I saw the guy who asked me Ibrahim he was very friendly and that for me I said okay you know what and I seen the window of opportunity for me to escape my predicament that's why I say, yes, why, why not? Why not running another religion? Because since we run Islam at school anyway, so it's not like anything. So I, I accepted it. And of course, I didn't probably become a major change in my life. Yes, today I'm not an Islam. I'm a Christian because I don't think I would ever change my religion that level, but at least given me an escape to do that. So sometimes in life, we will face difficulties. We might come through a lot of hardship, you know, and then our priorities have to change. And what's at that time that I need to change my priorities? Rather focusing on the religions, but seeing how do I escape my current predicament and move forward in my life? And that's what's really what taught me. And just tell our, our, our audience here, uh, Dr. Teban, that decision, how did it then lead to you being in Khartoum? Because I've got a question of another choice you made when you were there. Yeah, well, look, when I, we, this is there's something very important about me in life up to today. Whatever I do, I do it to the best of my ability. And when I convert to Islam, I've read the Quran with passion. And I could have, within three, four weeks, I could able to lead prayers. And that actually convinced my captors that I could be a very good convertee. And that was, that's when they offered me an opportunity to go to North Sudan to study uh, Kalwa. But when I went there, it was nice because it was first time that I had breakfast, lunch, and supper. I was looked after very well properly. But the biggest problem that I needed an education. Yeah. And the, the, the Quran could not offer me that education. I could become a world expert in Quran, and that's it. But I needed more than that. And my, my journey was beyond being an a imam, was beyond being a Catholic priest, was beyond, even beyond being a pope. I needed to do something else with my life. And that's what entrenched me to actually run away and start another journey. Right. I want to pause there. We're going to take one or two questions in, in the chat. But you've just said something so interesting to me. How did you know at that age that, you know, your journey is bigger than being an imam, your journey is bigger than what you being offered by your captors who had sent you to Khartoum, what drove that inside yourself, that realization at such a young age? I, th I think because from young age, we already went, I went through a lot of hardship in my life with the war, atrocities. I've seen quite a lot of things that went wrong and my mother always kept us in the, in the grand and religious way. I think because of my hardship. So what I did, I always learned from my hardship, from difficult that I went through, whether it's hunger, whether it's to do with the being abused, beaten up, I always take responsibility for them. I never ever blame someone else for my problems. And if you, today you hit me by mistake, I will take responsibility for that. I will not blame you for it. And I think probably that taught me to think completely different. And of course, one of the most important was reading. I used to enjoy reading a lot of literature books. You know, like I remember one of the books called Great Escape. I enjoyed reading them. So for me, reading was something that also taught me how to, how to persevere. And I always very entrenched with that. And it sounds to me, um, just from what you have described that, uh, and tell me if it, it should be correct, how, if you describe yourself as that, because I'm getting a sense that you have this um, internal locus of control. You know, if you use a popular phrase that you are saying, I am in charge of things happening to me. If it will be, it's up to me, if you can almost capture it like that. Would that be a correct as, a, 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 a conclusion on the mindset that you had? I think you're absolutely right. Everything happens 
based on you, how you wanted them to happen. They don't happen by chance. Things happen because of what we have pronounced, what our mind, we set our mind onto. And that's been constant story in my life was that I set my mind to come to South Africa, I arrive in South Africa. I set my mind of finding education, I find education. I set my mind to become the best doctor and I did. So whatever you actually set your mind on, the nature, universe, and the world actually will conspire and make sure that oh, you achieve those goals. It's all in our mindset. But, but again, we, most of us tend to choose certain paths that everybody walk. And I knew already from a young age that if anybody gonna go right, I will choose left. Right. Yeah, it's gonna be a road that is rough. Nobody's been there before. But I know that if I arrive, I'm gonna be the earliest there and I might actually find the fattest womb that exists there. And that's always been my, my, my thinking. And uh, those uh, values actually work for me. Wow. Let's go to the, to, to the chat. It's a buzzing with questions. Uh, we've got a Kumen chat is asking here, how did your experiences impact your faith or religion? I think, I think uh, look, uh, I have to be honest with you. When I grow up, I was religious because I read a Bible and I read the Quran. And when I was stranded in Addis Ababa, I had a New Testament and I prayed day in, day out. And what I found out that the more I pray, the more I'm not progressing. And I'm not getting any miracles either. But the moment that I stop praying and start taking steps toward my dreams, everything becomes realistic. So today, I will tell every young person out there that God only works when you work harder. That's my opinion. That's where I be. Whether you're Muslim or Christian or Hindu, God only works when you work harder. And when you do your part, those things become realistic. So today, I don't spend time in the church on my knee. I always tell people that if you look into my stomach, you will find a lot of ulcers from stress, but you will never find a mark on my knee or my forehead because of the prayers. Because I believe that right. we are created in the image of God. And if you're created in his image, means we are in, we are in all likeliness is like him. And that means we are capable of doing a lot of things that he can do. And, and it's my duty to make sure that I inspire myself to achieve all those things so that people can see that it's not about the press, not about the church you visit to, but it's about the amount of work, that amount of work and amount of reading the skills that you have that extra for what God loves in you. The more you do great things, the more you make different humanity, that's for me, it's what God wants us to do. Because God, if he was going to create us a perfect world, then he would never have given us brain. He would never have given us nice muscles and all this healthy life. He given us those things in our mind for us to make a choices and decisions. So I believe that decision is a man problems. It's got nothing to do with God because there's no way in hell that God would say that the Japanese should live up to age of 100 and Africans must die by age of 45, 50. It doesn't make sense. The reason Africans die and suffer at this age is just because we are not productive enough. We have not spent time working hard and changing our circumstance. What happened that every circumstance that happened, we, we either attributed them to to, to, to God or we attribute them to the colonizers that colonize us, which is wrong. The colonizers has gone long time ago. Why are we still being chained down in prison? And that chain, that prison, we lock ourselves in. And I think in my mind, I lo take myself, lock myself in prison and give the key to the Europeans, say control me from there or have the remote control to control me. And I think we need to change that mindset because I think Africa will survive in the next million years and there'll be new generation million years and they will survive, but they will only become better depending on their mindset. So if you have to change our mindset and accept what we have now and changing it and make better out of it and God probably will love us more. 
So for me, it's not really about God. God is there, but only work harder the more you're working harder. So we've talked a lot. Thank you. We've talked a lot about mindset. I just want to mention that, you know, for us in academia, we like defining things for our audience. When we speak of mindset, we're really talking about a specific set of beliefs, knowledge, and thought processes that we have for ourselves and others. That's what we call mindset, a set of beliefs and thought processes and knowledge that we have and underline we have for ourselves and others. And of course, what we are seeing from this story that a mindset certainly affects our behavior, how the mindset that Dr. Teben had propelled him to make choices that got him to be where he is today. There's a nice thank you for the work that you do from Grab Gabriela in the chat. And then there's also a lovely comment around, it's so beautiful, the help that you got from uh, uh, Bishop Joe Sandry and testimony to Catholic values. And now um, the work that you are doing, we'll get to that as we, as we get close to the end, the work that you are doing on COVID as a pulmonologist, we are not quite yet there. And then there's a question from Saeed Mohammed. How much learning the Quran inspired you to be where you are today? Uh, let me just see. I think there's two questions in one. Or I, and then they're just asking, do you still read the Quran today? Does it inspire you? So the first uh, part, the learning from the Quran, getting you to where you are, do you still read it today? Does it inspire you? Uh, thank you so much, Said. I think the honest really that uh, whether you read Quran or you read Bible, they all talk about love, forgiveness, hard work, work for your bread and all those kind of stuff. So there's none, no, no book actually talk that just sit down on your bums and you will be rewarded. No. So I think, yes, Quran, Bible is really the same thing for me. They, they really, they are there to advise you. It helps you with your moral, morality, the way you think and all that. But at the end of the day, we still must use those values to change our, our path. And that's the reality, yes. Do I read Quran? Yes, I do read Quran sometimes. If they got English version, I do read it. I did read the Bible, but if I have time. But now, because I'm preoccupied, I'm more like using the veilers that I have known before. Right, thank you for that. Just want us to move a little bit. I'm coming back, audience. I'm seeing your lovely, lovely questions and comments. I want us to get out of Sudan. So I'm moving us into Eritrea now. So I want Dr. Tabin to tell us how he ended up in Eritrea. My reading of the story, he seems to think he was going back home and he seems to have taken a wrong turn. I'll leave you to get the book to read more about that yourself, but let's hear from the good doctor. How did you end up in Eritrea? Well, I went there because I was trying to run away to South Sudan. That's when I found myself in Eritrea. Yes, but when I went in Eritrea, of course, that's when I saw new, new environment, new life. But the very important lesson for me to, to, to teach, uh, to tell my audience that when I was at a number one, I went to Catholic church to look for food. After I got the food, I was handed over to police. Then I got locked up for three months. Then after being locked up, I was released and handed over to UN. And UN actually wanted to take me to refugee camp where I was going to be in refugee camp with no education, absolute nothing at the age of 16 years old for five years while waiting for settlement to go to America. And I decided to say, no, I'm not going to go to, to the camp. I needed to go to school, and they couldn't offer me a school. So I, so I decided to choose the street over going to refugee camp. And most people, most South Sudanese, actually they end up in those camps for five years. And my thinking was that at the age of 16, if I don't get a school, five years' time, I'll be 21. Even if they resettle me to the U.S., I will not be able to achieve anything academically. It means I'm going to be a laborer forever. And something told me that was a right decisions. And, and for me, not many people are able to make those kind of decisions. It's very, very important. And the second thing, of course, when I took my first trip to leave Eletria and then coming back again. Also, it, it taught me quite a lot of issues. But the, there's one most important thing about the co colleagues that I found and we end going from organization to organization who supported me. And after that, it actually turns against me. That's when I decide not to trust humanity again. So, so again, it tells you that sometimes we tend to rely so heavily on others, while in reality that we should be looking at our inner strength, that we are capable of doing things ourselves. And that's what, for me, what I learned from Eletria. Yes, I was always in journey, and I knew one thing in Eletria that no matter how beautiful the country and the city was, that I was unable to learn the language quicker, 
and I will not get into education. Means I, will, I become uncomfortable. And that's when I took a difficult, painful journey. And that related to our story currently in South Africa. Look, COVID has happened. Most people have lost their businesses. So people have two choices. One of them, to cry fault, waiting for government grants. And the second thing is, of course, to saying, the business was meant to die. It says died. I need to create another idea. Or I need to move out of a job or go to Cape Town or somewhere where I could find different opportunity or change your way of thinking completely because it haven't worked. Now, if your coronavirus has killed your business now, means it was already dying. So it means you must come with a new idea. So my, my, my point to, to the audience out there that don't get stuck into comfort zone. If you are young, if you're between 30 and 50 years old, if you're comfortable, then you have problems because life is a journey. And Africa needed you to do a great things, to be productive and being uncomfortable. Comfortable, yes, you might be staying something and you're comfortable in something, but think about the child living, living deep sleuth in Orange Farm who have absolutely nothing. Who's gonna create jobs to these people? Because the same child is gonna come and break into your house and maybe kills you. But if we do something that can enable live those societies, then we can make a great service to humanity. Whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, whatever it is, that's what God wanted us to do: is to be more productive and change the change the, the, the lives of other human beings. So there you are in Eritrea, yeah? and you are saying to yourself, um, "I don't want to be in a comfort zone, right?" I need education. And on page 82, you then say, having decided on my next goal, I caught a bus from the south of Eritrea and crossed the border illegally into Ethiopia, traveling to Addis Ababa and then to Moyale, a town on the border with Kenya. It was a journey of around 2,000 kilometers. Moyale is famous as a center for smuggling immigrants from Ethiopia and Eritrea into Kenya and in some cases on to South Africa. Right? So you mm -hmm. made this choice. You, want, you don't want to become comfortable in Eritrea. There's a language issue. You need education. I need to be in Kenya. So we've moved now, South Sudan, Eritrea. We're now in Kenya. Tell us what happened, your first attempt at being in Kenya. Audience, bear with me. Let's get a little bit of Kenya because from the story, you realize that Kenya was the stepping stone into South Africa. Then I'll come back quickly to the chat. I think Kenya was a very horrible place to me on my first journey, because the first journey, number one, I tried to make the journey. I ended losing my money. I almost got killed on the forest, working throughout the night. And I was robbed of all my money, was humiliated, and dropped back to Ethiopia side. And that's when I ended working the, in the restaurant in Ethiopia side as a, as a to wash dishes and also the same thing, saving people to, in, 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 so that I can get in return the place to sleep. And that, it tells you about priorities in life. So a current of COVID scenario, whenever you get stuck into something, your priority must come first. And that time the priority in Kenya was for me to find food and place to stay. That's why and I lower myself to start working in the restaurant. And then after there, I have to make a completely different decision that listen, I cannot go to Kenya now. I have no money, I have nothing. I need to go back to Eritrea. So I make a back 2,000 miles, 2,000 kilometer journey back to Ethiopia, to, to Eritrea, where I suffer the greatest in terms of walking. I walk almost most of those distance because, and I end spending six weeks as a street child. And that was very difficult. But the surprising that when I arrived in Eritrea, the day I arrived one week later, I got money. And I was able to decide now I'm gonna go back to Kenya again. I will reattempt the, the trip. Many of us have started businesses, and when they find hurdles, they give up. They, they start a small kind of project. They find difficult, they, they give up. They do research, difficult, they give up. And the question that I think as a human being, we must order to see the outcome. And we should not give up because of the difficulties that we face. We should be giving up because, not, not because we can't do it. We must complete the project first. If it's fail, Complete it. Once you complete it, then see what happened. But most of the time, once it's difficult for you to complete it, chances are good that you could have hit the jackpot. But we give up before actually we complete the projects. And of course, it speaks to this amazing title, 
uh, that, 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 that you gave for your book, the boy who never gave up, the theme of not giving up comes strongly. And I'm sure our audience are also now picking up this refugee's epic journey to triumph. We are seeing this epic journey, you know, South Sudan, Eritrea by mistake, Kenya, back to Eritrea, back to Kenya. Really, really epic. Let's take some questions. First question for you, uh, Dr. Teban, is how did you learn to remain focused on your goals. You spoke about the focus that you had to go back to Kenya, for example. Well, I didn't have a friends to listen to. I didn't have a family to, to warn me. I didn't have a plan B either. You see, when you have plan B, it means you have somebody, somebody to fall into. But I have none of the above. I was alone in the world. So it means, the only way is to move forward because I've lost everything. But moving forward, I have more to gain. Moving to unknown territory, you'd be surprised. And I always say, in South Africa, we should be asking about Van Riebeck. What drove him to South Africa? Why, what bring him to Cape Town? We shouldn't be asking, why was he there? Why he left all these? I mean, you could, Van Riebeck could not stay in Somalia. You could not stay in Mozambique, but he landed in Cape of Good Hope. What was his mindset? And that's always about me. I wasn't, I'm not afraid about, I'm not, I, I'm not excited about the outcome. I always like to understand why did it happen? What dropped these people to these levels? And the moment that we start going back and start thinking, why, why, why? I think we get the answers. So for me, the focus was that I have nothing to lose, but more to gain. And of course, because the more attempts I do, the more I succeed in it, and that reinforces my belief that in fact, in life, I need to take that step. Whether everybody disagree with me, I know that I will get there. I think over time, I develop those instincts within me. Every human being has instincts, but most of us, because we haven't developed those instincts, we can't even make a decision. The reason that because we allow other people to make the decision on our behalf, no matter whether we're happy or, or unhappy about it, and that need to, to stop. I say, as an MBA, candidate, you need to learn how to make decisions because society needed people that can make decisions. And that's what leadership is all about. Wow, thank you, thank you. So much lovely comment. Just give you a sense, Dr. Teban. I agree with you, being productive in your belief and faith is important. That's from Teboho. Again, Kumen Shetty coming back and saying, she absolutely love your response. Human beings, ourselves, we separate ourselves through religion, but the principles, messages remain the same. Uh, well done for what you have done um, in terms of, you know, working hard to be where you are. You are such an inspiration. Um, you are a living epitome of be the change that you want to see in the world, a true inspiration. So lovely, lovely. Please keep the questions and, and, and comments coming. Let's then move to you now in Kenya. You spoke a little bit earlier about sometimes learning you know, to, 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 to distrust maybe humanity or to distrust, you know, relatives who have, have not been able to help you. Tell us about arriving in Kenya. You've got a relative there, but it doesn't seem they are willing or able. I couldn't quite tell from the story. You tell us, were they willing and able or were they able and unwilling to help you? I think initially he was happy to help me, but of course when he found that I, did, I was going to stay longer, and I think he didn't have the, 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 the will or financial capacity to help me. And that was the reality. I think in Africa we tend to be, we think that because we come from the same village, means everybody from that village is your brother, must support you. But you've forgotten that when you turn 18, actually you should be bearing your own cross. You should be making all your, all your own plan because you have a father and mother. They should be responsible for you not your relatives. And I think that's when they asked me about what is my plan? And then of course, am I willing to go to refugee camp? And the answer is another five years waiting for a settlement. Yes, US is great, but no, I'm not gonna wait for five years to go to US. My life needs to start going because every day in my life, it means something. The day that I miss, I fall behind compared to other males around the world. So I need to make sure that I move forward. And when, when, when my uncle asked me that, then I make that instant decision to leave to South Africa. And that's for me, was not well thought of, but because I already mentioned that I'm going to South Africa, 
my mind has professed it, then I need to complete the journey. Now, that's always what I tell people about the Great Wall of China. When someone says, we're going to build this wall with no machines, and everybody went and built. In Africa, if you tell them, guys, we're going to build a wall in Johannesburg, everybody's going to say, right, where are we going to get the bricks? Uh, but what, what about water? You find a reason why you cannot do the, the, you cannot actually do the task. And after you exhaust everything, everybody's discouraged. And the reality is that I think maybe we must just stop doing a lot of questioning everything. Because I think in your mind, if you think of idea, take a step and realize those ideas. The fact that that idea only you thought of it and nobody has thought about it means probably there's something special about it that you would succeed in it. But I'm not saying that we must reinvent the wheel. No, there are certain ideas that are unique to us. Please, the honest is on you to make sure that you make them realistic. We are in conversation with Dr. Emmanuel Turban, a leading pulmonologist. We are talking about this amazing book, The Boy Who Never Gave Up. I am sure you'd agree with me that this Gibbs Flash Forum is ablaze with ideas, information on how can we better our lives? How can we develop that mindset of just wanting to explore what's out there, that mindset you know, to constantly be improving our lives. You heard earlier on from Dr. Teben, he mentioned it briefly, you may have missed it. He said, the idea of going to Johannesburg was not well thought of. And I was quickly trying to find the part in my book where he described that, please, if you haven't got a copy of this book, do yourself a favor, published by Jonathan Paul Publishers, available at Exclusive Books and many other leading bookstores. We go to page 102. And here we read, the evening before I had bought a cock and had noticed that it was made in South Africa, I was surprised that cock was not produced locally in Kenya. That thought still lingered in my head. I am going to go to South Africa. I told him, he's talking about his, uh, you know, a conversation with, with his uncle here. Okay, he said, obviously surprised. When are you going to South Africa? So that's what he meant when Dr. Taban is telling us it was not well thought of. The idea was triggered by seeing it in the, on, on, on the can. So he didn't set out from South Sudan to say, I'm going to South Africa, right? And what we are hearing from what he's sharing with us is being flexible in our thinking. It's, it's, it's being open to explore new adventures should need arise. So let's move fast forward, then we'll go again you know, to questions. Before we do that, there's a part of the book before we get to Kenya that I felt was quite emotional that I'd like you to touch on briefly. You talk about on page 96, by now I had accepted that I would not be returning to Sudan anytime soon and that I should try to reach another place where I could get an education. I learned to cope with cold or wet nights on the street. I hardly noticed the hard pavements or dirty doorways because I felt that these were just the hardship you should expect when you were wandering as I was. I had no blanket or pillow, and often I lay simply on bare concrete, hugging myself to keep warm. I might not have known what my ultimate destination would be, but I did know that I was on a journey and that I would never give up hope of reaching a good destination. That thought kept me going and I could manage without food, and without showering most days. I guess I must often have smelled bad, but I didn't care. Pride was a luxury I could not afford. I could keep going because I had nothing left to lose, but everything to gain. Firstly, what emotion do you experience as I read that paragraph that you, that you wrote so vividly, visceral, telling us what you were going through. What emotion do you go through as a 44-year-old now? I'd like you to touch briefly on that for our audience. I, I, I think, I think for, for me, that's a part of the book that whenever I uh, encounter difficulties, that's a part that actually become emotional, sometimes shed some tears. And that probably was the lowest part, point of my life, you know, where I pressing deeper and there was nowhere else to go. You know, when you reach the bottom, bottom, that was me. And from there, there was only one way, upward and forward. And that was that moment. And yes, 
I, I didn't have clothes. I was smelling. Yeah. But you know, you know, let's be honest. Who cares? <laughs> it was me. You understand? Yeah. I didn't have a girl to impress. I didn't have a family to impress. I was surviving. It was survival mode. And that was the moment that probably mentally I become very strong. Yeah. Decision making, I become very strong. And that was a moment that I was not longer afraid. That was the moment after today, I don't care. Because nobody could have told me anything. Nobody cannot tell me today that what you're saying is rubbish. No, it's not. I know what I'm talking about because I've been there. I've been to the lowest, but today I'm on the highest. And because of those hardships that I went through, that's why I always embrace that part. And I will always like to read to my kids. I wanted them to be aware of that, that listen, their dad is not just on the TV. That that used to be nobody. And today, anybody in this country can become any, anything in their lives. But you have to learn how to take the road where nobody walk. That's a Stop constant theme following. coming through. Mm. Yeah, you have to do that. And also, I did mention initially in, 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 my, in the beginning that about being a black male in Africa and South Africa, I would like to most of the black males, I'm not, you know what, I'm not racist, but think back as a male, have we done enough in South Africa, in Africa, to make this continent a better place? Have you worked hard enough to change a lot of lives? Because it's our duties to make sure that our women, our children will have a better future. Have we worked enough? Have we spent time? Or are we just wanted to have a quick fix so that the society can look at us, look up driving this fancy car, have expensive clothes, whatever. Or are we enough to be happy in something and, and close our eyes and forget about deep sleep? I wanted everybody to think, the fact that you say something, think back about those people because those are people that actually represent you. When you're successful, as long as those people are poorer, you don't get respect. You are respect only when we can change the lives in Soweto, we can change the lives in Tembisa, we can change the lives in, in, in Orange Farm. If we cannot change the lives of those children, then my dear friend, you're not successful. And that's for me, it's our duty as Africans that we need to cover to our own, own people. White people have done very well wherever they are. They've done very well. But for us Africans, I think we need to start thinking globally. And everywhere every African goes, you are judged from the country that you come from and your people behavior. And I think it's time that we need to change that. And so our duty is not the role for Ramaphosa to change it. It's me and you that must make those difference. And those leaders can listen to us. It's so amazing how you are challenging us. Thank you, Dr. Seven, to define success in ways maybe that are broader than acquiring you know, material things in life. I sense that is the challenge that you are putting forward to us. I'm just gonna go to the chat as we approach end of this hour. I'm sure a lot of our, our audience here, they want to know, so what happened from Kenya you know, to South Africa and how did you become a doctor? I want to finish on that. But before I do that, one or two questions, then we move. One of the questions in the chat from uh, Jeanette Johnson is saying, would you say that half your battle was won through determination and greed to achieve your vision? I, I, I think, yes, yes. I think probably, I think determination, you know, yeah. determination provides the, it's very important aspect in everybody's lives. You know, when, it, determination by definition, you know, when you find a bit of hardship and you just march on, that's determination. When you run in comrade and you feel tired, but then you decide, I'm going to be running in perspective. I'm going to fall down. I'd rather fall down than stopping. That's a de determination. When you find hardship in your assignment and you decide to work throughout the night, that's determination. Yes, I think determination provides what define me. But the one of the most important aspect I want to, because we almost, I think the time I see, the time is like against yes. us. But one of the important things, of course, when I arrived in South Africa, I only I did five years, of, yeah, five years of school. Then... I was taken, I went to what we call Lukwatini to attend the school because I didn't have any certificate next to border of Swaziland. And I did stand at nine and 10. And I end passing with age of 54. I passed with a max of 
And that particular moment, I was offered to do electrical engineering at Vets Technicon. And most people could have been happy to take the course. It's not that I'm not, I, I looked at a technician. No, it was not my calling. It was not part of my passion. I think that my passion lie on medicine. Even though that time I didn't know what it entail, how would I get the funding? And that I told, I remember I told the Dean at Vets Technical that no, I'm not gonna do the course. I'm gonna go and repeat my trick. And when I went to a, a to matric to the JP High School for Boys, and they offered me an opportunity at the age of 20 to do matrix. But remember, when I went to JP, I was 20 years old, turning 21. I already did matrix. I didn't have money. And JP High School for Boys does not take anybody above the age of 20. They cannot take people to repeat matrix, and they don't take people even with no money. But again, in life. When you make a decision that I'm gonna walk from Joburg to Pretoria, you'll be surprised. Please take that step, walk. You'll be surprised what help support can come along your way. And at that time at JP High School, I sat on my friend to ask them and the headmaster, the deputy headmaster, he looks at me and say, come on Monday and hoping that I will not come back. But I didn't see myself as being 20 year old. I didn't see myself as being poor. I never seen somebody who has failed my trick. I come back with confidence to him and say, yes, I'm ready, I wanna go to school. And I put him in the corner and he didn't tell the headmaster and guess what? He allowed me to repeat my trick at age of 20. I was the only person in the history of JP that actually did a metric at age of 20. And of course I didn't disappoint, I did very well. So the opportunities are going to be there. So stop looking at your age, Still looking at your disability, still looking at your color. If you go to interview and you fail, please don't blame racism onto it. Don't blame your color on it. Don't say because I'm a female or because I'm black. No, ask yourself, why did you fail the interview? Means you are not good enough. Or maybe that's not where you're supposed to be. Maybe that you, you are supposed to be somewhere else. So people need to start taking responsibility on their own action and start asking that deeper question within themselves. Wow, and I have to read this one as we start wrapping up because we've got Tumisho Marco here in the audience. This is what uh, the message says for you, Dr. Tevin. I had the pleasure of meeting and schooling with Dr. Tevin at GPI School for Boys when he first arrived in South Africa. Every element of his story was shared with me as a young man almost 20 years ago and how he has overcome all odds gives me continued courage. So there is somebody who knows you. Another wow. question says, has your journey made you a tough parent? How I think yes. is your parenting? Maybe we can rephrase it like that. <laughs> no, I think that's very important because I have three daughters and I always tell them, I remember my daughter come and she came with 78%. And they say, then I say, no, I'm not happy with it. Then she asked me, but daddy, I did very well, 78%. I said, no, tell me about the food you eat. Is it 78% or 100%? <laughs> then say 100%. I said, no, I only accept 90% because you got my brain. And, and of course now she average her marks 86% every time. It's not like to tell her because I know that she can do it. I believe in there. I would not have problems if they get 75% after studying hard. But if they haven't studied hard, they're watching TV all the time, they get 75%, I'm not gonna accept that. So for me as a parent, we should be asking our kids to, to reach for goal. And you must accept, if they get 40% it's fine, provided that they have worked hard for it, they've tried their best. But don't tell me they try their best when they spend time on TV, they're not doing any work, no. So there is a question on parenting. I think we're exactly at 11 o'clock. It's been an awesome Gibbs Flash Forum. We are in conversation with Dr. Emmanuel Taban. He's got this amazing book. The Boy Who Never Gave Up, A Refugee's Epic Journey to Triumph. We cannot do justice in an hour on such an amazing book and such an amazing life. Please do yourself a favor. The book is published by Jonathan Ball Publishers, available at Exclusive Books and all good bookstores. Get yourself a copy. In concluding, Dr. Teben, thank you for this awesome hour. What is the one thing 
about your journey that you can tell the audience from poverty in South Sudan to a world-renowned pulmonologist? Well, I will tell everybody that life is a journey and every journey must have purpose. And every journey, in terms of purpose, during our journey of purpose, of course, we do encounter a lot of difficulties, hardship, and they're there to teach you a lesson. They're there to make you stronger. They're there, there to, to reinforce your belief. The most important is that never, ever give up. Please owe it to yourself to complete your journey. Our journeys are all different. Your journey is not like mine. Mine is not like yours. Please own your journey because at the end of the day, you need to tell the young generation, how did you take your own personal journey? So please don't keep up on your personal journey and make the best out of it. There you've got it, the one-liner, and that's exactly what the book says, the boy who never gave up. It's unsurprising that Dr. Teban concludes by telling us to not give up. Thank you so much for joining us on this Gibbs Flash Forum. Thank you so much, Dr. Teban, for this amazing hour that you gave us. We know you are busy in your practice. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. I'll now hand over to my co colleagues and thank them for making this webinar happen. Thank you, JD, and thank you, Tim.